All right. Uh, now that now that we have everyone, uh, we might as well go ahead and get started. Uh, give introductions, everything. Give Nicole a few few moments to collect herself. Um, so thank you all for coming. Uh, appreciate you making it uh, over to ITIF for uh, I think must be the city's like ten billionth event on net neutrality. Um, we've convened this panel uh, hoping to find uh, uh, or at least discuss the potential for finding the right path forward for, for net neutrality. Um, you know, one would think that after this debate has raged for well over a decade, we would be uh, closer, at least, you know, close to finding a, a real solution to be putting this issue behind us. Uh, but instead, frankly, it feels like we're even further from that sort of solution. Uh, policymakers have explored a sort of a, a number of different imperfect uh, uh, ways to, to craft net neutrality regulation or net neutrality policy. Um, and uh, it appears that we're uh, stuck in something of a, a ping pong, right? On one extreme, you have the sort of net neutrality purists that are pushing for a very strict regime under uh, Title II of the Communications Act, where broadband internet access would be regulated as a common carrier. Um, on the other side, uh, what appears to be the direction that the, the current administration is, is heading in uh, is a, uh, a, a much lighter touch approach, either on, uh, under Title I of the, uh, of the Communications Act and perhaps, uh, uh, perhaps abstaining from regulating broadband at all and kicking the, interest, uh, the issue over to uh, antitrust uh, authorities, either in the courts or the FTC. So we have these sort of two extremes. Uh, I personally am not a fan of the sort of assumption that, you know, when there are two extremes, the right answer is necessarily somewhere in between. Sometimes one side is right. But I think here, the, uh, at least our perspective at ITIF, that is the right approach. There are legitimate concerns on both sides of this issue. And we'd like to see a sort of middle ground approach uh, crafted at the F FCC. Uh, we think that the net neutrality, the, the problem that net neutrality regulation would be trying to solve is generally overstated. A lot of the issues that have arisen in the past were not uh, as extreme as some pol policy advocates have painted them to be. Uh, we think that some differential tr treatment of internet traffic can be a good thing. I think that this occurs at the margin for applications that are high bandwidth and extremely latency sensitive and very uh, um, concerned about uh, characteristics of the network that really push the boundaries of what can be provided over, or over the sort of best efforts open internet today. And so that at the margin, some differential treatment uh, uh, should be a good thing is pro-competition, pro-consumer. I uh, want to see room for that. But we also want to ensure a baseline best efforts internet, an open internet that continues to see investment, that continues to grow over time, higher speeds, higher performance, uh, and continues to see a flourishing open internet of uh, growing innovation from edge providers, large and small. Um, but enough for me. We've uh, convened a, a panel of three very distinguished experts. Uh, we have much longer uh, bios online, uh, but I'll give uh, brief introductions. Uh, first, we have Larry Downs. Uh, Larry is our business guru. He is a senior industry and innovation fellow at the Georgetown Center for Business and Public Policy. He's a best-selling author on developing business strategies in the age of accelerating technological disruption. Uh, next, we have Nicole Turner-Lee. Nicole is a fellow for the uh, Center for Technology Innovation at the Brookings Institution. Uh, she comes from Brookings from the Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council, or MMTC. At MMTC, she was Vice President and Chief Research and Policy Officer, working to ensure equal opportunity in civil rights and mass media t telecommunications and broadband. She has a PhD in sociology, so brings a welcome perspective, uh, adds a welcome perspective to the usual sort of tech, law, economics uh, vectors in this, in this debate. And at the end of the table, we have Scott Walston. Scott Walston is president and senior fellow at the Technology Policy Institute. Scott is an accomplished economist focusing on telecommunications, regulation, competition, technology policy. He was the economics director for the FCC's National Broadband Plan. And Scott also recently served as an editor of the special, a special issue of the Review of Industrial Organization, pulling together cutting edge academic work on net neutrality. So a brief note on format, uh, we're going to give each of our panelists uh, opportunity for opening remarks, uh, five to ten minutes. Uh, 
and then I will lead a, uh, a moderating Q&A. Uh, at the end, we will be opening up to audience questions, so please be thinking of, uh, of what you, questions that you have, what you'd like to uh, discuss with the panelists. Uh, we also uh, you know, are live streaming, and we welcome interaction uh, from the uh, Twitterverse. Uh, we'll be using the hashtag ITIF broadband, uh, so if anyone would like to send me questions uh, during the Q&A uh, that way, uh, we'll be trying to, to monitor. Uh, so with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Larry, opening thoughts, comments, uh, net neutrality. How do we find a, a way forward through this morass? All right. <clears throat> well, thank you, Doug, and good morning, everybody. Um, Doug said I'm the business guru, but actually my comments are all legal and policy, um, so <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'm going to switch hats. Uh, I did jot down some notes on the plane yesterday, uh, which is unfortunate because then it means I'm going to read them. But um, uh, I'm very glad to... Uh, to, to be here. I'm not necessarily glad to be talking about this particular topic, but I'm certainly uh, glad to be here. And I want to start with a, uh, a sort of a, a reminiscence. I'm going to end with a reminiscence, and I'll hide the policy stuff in the middle. So um, I was looking on the plane, and according to Wikipedia, uh, Sisyphus was the first king of Ephira who was punished for his self-aggrandizing craftiness and deceitfulness by being forced to roll an immense boulder up a hill only to watch it come back to hit him, repeating this action for eternity. Uh, I am not the king of Ephira, and I'm hardly alone in pushing the net neutrality boulder up the hill only to have it come down and hit me. I haven't even been at this as long as some of my fellow panelists and looking in the room, many of you. Um, and I don't know if I'm being punished for my self-aggrandizing craftiness and deceitfulness or for many other sins, but I certainly feel punished for something. Um, very innocently, I wrote, um, the first time I ever wrote about the Title II uh, or net neutrality was in 2005 and then again in 2006. Uh, I was not a communications policy person at that time. Uh, I was writing a sort of legal expert column for a now defunct magazine called CIO Insight. And in preparation for today's panel, I reread those, uh, those old essays, and I think what's, what's most depressing is, as Doug suggested, how little has changed in over a decade other than the level of absurdity uh, of the debate. Uh, as Marx once paraphrased Goethe, history always repeats itself the first time as tragedy, the second time as farce, and I just wish Goethe had said what happens the fourth, fifth, and sixth times. Um, the event description for today's panel asks at the end, what is the FCC's best uh, path forward in the short term while legislation winds its course, which Band-Aid is our best option? Uh, you, that's how you put it then. Uh, you're, you were a, a little less uh, uh, direct just now. But, <laughs> um, but I think by acknowledging that legislation is not, to put it mildly, imminent, uh, and to accept the fact that whatever does happen for the next, what, year, four years, eight years, uh, it'll be a Band-Aid, uh, which it is. Uh, is to acknowledge that we will be right back here or some equivalent location both soon and regularly. Uh, so is that tragedy, is that farce, or is that something else? Um, so let's go back to first principles. Let me tell you, here, here's six things that I, that I still believe um, from, from 2005. Uh, one, the open internet principles or the bright line rules more or less are indeed a good idea. Two. Um, no one with a straight face can make the argument that Title II was written with broadband internet access in mind, not in 1996 and certainly not as it's involved since then. Uh, we only need to look at how many of the 2015 uh, orders, 400 pages, were devoted to forbearance from inapt public, poli public utility components, components of the regulations that have accumulated over the last century, give or take a few decades, uh, to see that. Uh, or to have some mild concern with the number of times the phrase for now and at this time are attached to that forbearance discussion. Number three, the broadband revolution, both wired and mobile, has generated profound value, no matter how you measure it. So now I've got my business hat back on. Uh, revenue, market capitalization, consumer surplus, uh, no one wants this party to stop. Uh, number four, the damage to that ecosystem from a lack of open internet rules, whatever their legal basis, is still almost entirely hypothetical. Uh, the rules, to use an oft-repeated term in the 2010 version of the order, were prophylactics. The broadband market, for what it's worth, is more competitive now than it was in 1996 and in, 19, and in 2005 as well. It's not perfect competition, but then no market ever is, at least not at any given point in time. Uh, number five, the cost of regulation should be, as Ronald Coase argued, weighed against its benefits and compared to the costs of market alternatives. If the former outweigh the latter, 
regulations should still be narrowly tailored to solve measurable problems in the least interventionist way possible in the hopes particularly of minimizing unintended consequences. Uh, number six, the Congress did not do a perfect job in 1996 of predicting the future. That's no surprise. And with all respect to some members of the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals and the Chevron Doctrine, I don't think the FCC has the power to rewrite its governing statute, whether with good intentions or otherwise. Whether that's true or not, um, I think what we certainly can say uh, without argument is that doing so, among other things, does have the effect of politicizing what's supposed to be an independent expert agency which means, whatever side you're on, uh, whenever there's a change in regime, uh, under this model, we start the cycle over again. So that's, that's just unavoidable. Uh, so for now, everyone is guaranteed to lose this fight, uh, and repeatedly. So aren't you glad you <laughs> fought your way through the heat to, to come and, and hear this? Right. All right, so uh, I'm going to at last go to Doug's opening question, which is what's the best path forward in the short term? What's the best Band-Aid? Um, my answer is on balance that uh, to do what the current NPRM proposes, which is to undo the Title II sleight of hand, uh, restore the definition of public switch telephone network to something that passes a sniff test, and eliminate the star chamber that was created by the general conduct rule, and in do so restore the FTC's authority. Uh, as for the rest of the bright line rules in the 2015 order, I wish I could say I was confident that there was an ancillary authority hidden in Title I that would allow the Commission to have a cleaned up version of them stay in place and to do so without relying on the equally dubious authority of Section 706. Whether there is or isn't, I don't think that's the route the agency is, is heading down at this point, so perhaps we'll, we'll leave that to the discussion. Um, once the current NPRM is approved, we go back to the pre-2015 status quo with the FTC as the primary enforcer of potential anti-consumer practices and still with Congress weighing the decision to do what it has so far chosen not to do since 2005, which is to pass legislation updating in whole or in part the 1996 Act. And certainly they've, they have gone through several different possible pieces of legislation in that 12-year uh, period. Uh, I don't think that's a perfect solution. Uh, I agree with Doug on that. And I think on balance, though, it's likely to be the one that causes the least harm. Um, and to that point, let me just end with one last reminiscent. When I was a, a law clerk in the early 1990s, my boss one day faced what seemed to me to be a difficult decision. Uh, the Chicago School District had been fighting for a decade with a state financing authority that had itself been awkwardly created during a previous management crisis. And the two sides had become unable to negotiate on a budget. With an imminent school closing looming over his head, a well-intentioned district court judge had issued one stay after another, extending the inevitable and inviting more briefs, more motions, and more gamesmanship. Though after weeks of will he or won't he close the schools headlines on the front pages, the Court of Appeals where I was held an emergency hearing. And one hour later, my boss, with no apparent hesitation, dissolved all the stays and ordered the schools immediately closed. Uh, well, fellows, he said, nothing else to do now but go to lunch. <laughs> um, and by the time we got back, uh, an hour later, the warring parties had reached a deal. The students never missed a day of school. It was a terrible day for the lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Larry. It was entertaining uh, comments. Uh, Nicole, on to you. Uh, opening thoughts. Uh, what do you make of uh, sort of the opportunity for uh, where we're heading with net neutrality, what the what you might do uh, do instead, or uh, or are we going down the right path? Okay, Larry, I can't help it, but I just want to do one of these. <laughs> <laughs> so after you were done, I can't help it. Um, I'm Nicole Turner Lee. I'm at Brookings. We're nonpartisan, so I want to put that out there. Um, we are a research institution, uh, but for transparency's sake, many of you in this audience know me as an advocate. So um, I'm actually not wearing my advocate hat. I'm a retired advocate. Um, and one more focused on really trying to understand the balance of the argument of where we are now. And so I shared this story yesterday with Doug, because we were actually talking about net neutrality yesterday, where um, a couple months ago I lost my dad and I was off the grid. I wasn't on Twitter. I wasn't on Facebook. I was just sort of, you know, disconnected. And I came back to work and opened up all my social media and opened up all my newspapers and there 
flat in the middle was net neutrality. And I said, oh, Lord, it didn't go away. <laughs> right. And it's one of those cases where, as Larry said, not to be Debbie Downer, but it's an issue that appears not to have any resolution. And some of you might have seen my blog around a congressional solution, because what I tried to do is really understand what are the issues at stake? And as a person who had been removed from the issue and found myself slowly removing myself from the advocacy space, uh, what became apparent to me is that there are two different arguments going on um, out there when it comes to net neutrality. And there's really no clear definition of what people are arguing about um, and clearly no sense of people coming together for the ladies. That is like the argument that I've had with my sister for many years about that size four dress that neither one of us will get into. Um, we just can't let it go um, at this point, and there's just no way to sort of uh, negotiate through that. So I wanted to talk about sort of what Larry was talking about, but lead more towards why a congressional solution is probably necessary at this point. Um, clearly, for those of us that have watched this, de this debate, Title II was heavy-handed for whatever it's worth. And it was heavy-handed, you know, and again, I, not as an advocate, but as somebody who's looking back at it, because it was probably the only tool, the toolkit, that could be enforced under the Communications Act at that time. There wasn't, as Larry said, the flexibility, which is why there's a lot of forbearance around Title II when the reclassification came, because we're looking at an outdated Communications Act. And if we were trying to reach the goals of what Tim Wu put out there as the principles of net neutrality, which at that time for people um, who have not followed this debate was really about free speech and non-discrimination and First Amendment rights, et cetera, you know, trying to ensure that there was some type of critical protections for consumers, the thing in the toolkit that seemed most logical was Title II. The challenge has become that the argument that Tim Wu put out many, many years ago has changed because the internet has changed. None of us in this room would be talking about artificial intelligence. We would not be talking about drones. We would not be talking autonomous cars and applying the definition of what uh, was actually the concept behind net neutrality. All of us in this room, and I think that was glaringly obvious in the debate, we want an open internet. And as we talked about yesterday on a separate panel, in the United States, it's important to have internet freedom. And I think everybody in here is, is glaringly, overwhelmingly in agreement with that principle. And I would suggest that that's the argument on the other side, right? This principle of having an untethered internet, free of discrimination, free of monopolistic practices, et cetera. In value, that's fine. But the other side of the argument, which I think Larry's sort of appealing to, what Doug sort of mentioned, which is interesting to me, is how do you enforce it? <laughs> and the toolkit that was available was obviously the Communications Act and Title II. And so what we see on this other side is this conversation around jurisdiction and authority. All of you that are watching this debate, is it FCC over FTC? <laughs> is it Section 706 versus Title II? Is it, you know, should we apply this type of bright line versus this type of bright line? And this jurisdictional tension against a value-oriented start is a no-starter for anybody because it means that we don't have the tools available to us to really look at what this issue is. And myself being somebody who's done telecommunications work for a period of time on the ground and here in Washington, D.C., telecommunication, telecommunications policy has always been bipartisan. So it keeps me up at night that we actually can't, what I said, Doug, yesterday, roll up our sleeves and try to figure this out, given the fact that we're coming from two different spaces. Given that concern, some people have said, well, what do you do? I mean, the other question that I think ITF does, has spoken about so wonderfully is network management is another issue, right? Facebook just announced a couple of weeks ago that there are 2 billion users on their network. Now, just imagine, I was just coming from New York, picking up my kids who were my parents. I drove the car truck lane, right, where the, the lanes are a little wider. There's about five lanes. And I watched all the traffic <laughs> and the lanes designed for the car. Now think about the network today and all of the traffic that actually rides over the internet. Think about the tools and devices that are connecting to this network. That in itself, again, was not anticipated, nor is it really part of this conversation of capacity as we argue the values-oriented versus jurisdictional concern net neutrality debate. So people have asked me, you know, they said, Nicole, what is your scenarios? What would you suggest? I think part of the challenge that we're finding out in this particular um, quagmire that we're in is that there's no alternative that's being put on the table. And so I'd like to offer some things that I've kind of kicked around with people to see and hopefully we'll have more conversation. You know, clearly the four bright line rules that have been discussed as part of the negotiation process, no blocking, no discrimination, um, no throttling, greater transparency, perhaps there's a fifth bright line rule, right? And perhaps that fifth bright line is related to what people thought Title II was all about, consumer protection. 
Because at the end, when you're talking between Dems and Republicans, Dems are always going to err on the side of consumer protection. So I've suggested to people, maybe there's a way, and I'm not going to say this because the last meeting I said a catch-all, I think I almost got a pie thrown in my face. <laughs> so I'm not going to say a catch-all. But perhaps there's a way to massage consumer protection as a fifth bright line, right? There's something to be said around a complaint process, um, using a process where consumers can come right to the FCC to talk about complaints that they're having with various companies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What that does is it codifies the law of this issue. And it helps us as policymakers to put a stop in this conversation so that we can focus on the evolving internet as it is today. So that's one scenario. The other issue I like to bring up is the fact that the conversation is sort of morphed into, well, let's get rid of the FCC and let's just actually put everything at the FTC. I am one of those people that thinks that it's not deserving of a full overhaul of the FCC who's had ownership of this issue for 16 plus years. I think it's important to understand that the FTC does have authority to look at deceptive practices, fraudulent practices that occur online. They're doing an excellent job at that. But when you start looking at the pipes and reasonable network management, I'm not sure if an FTC uh, leader actually has that ability to do that. So I propose to people a hybrid model. Why not? Because again, when you strip away the sense of consumer protection for Democrats in particular, you give them this uh, feeling that that whole aspect is somewhat being obliterated, which again, I think is one of the reasons in my observation why Title II is so important for that and other unobvious reasons that people are not talking about, right? But if you did a hybrid model, you actually could create some way where there's shared authority between the two entities. And that shared authority allows you to move forward with the same type of outcomes that both sides want. A fair cop on the beat that will have parity over regulation or oversight over each party. Um, I think it's dangerous to say that the FCC has no authority, given the fact that the technical requirements of the network today are so much more different and so much more complicated than ever before. I think the other thing to think about, too, with regards to that is, again, moving towards that congressional solution. Um, I think it's time that Congress, again, steps in and really exercises leadership on this area and comes up with, if it's five bright lines, if it's four, if it's something. Because what happens is, and I'll, I'll sort of close with these final remarks, what happens when we stay in this debate? There are costs to this debate, and I'll just name a few. I just mentioned Facebook has two billion users. I said something in my comments around drones and artificial intelligence. The net neutrality debate that we're fighting today is not going to be relevant to the internet that's showing up tomorrow. It's not going to make sense. Uh, the, the values, the principles, the, the things that we're talking about just are not going to make sense in an evolving internet. And I could see it just based on the fact that the internet has moved so much more quickly. For those of us that have been deadheads in this debate uh, prior to 2010, the internet looks a whole lot different than it did when we first started this debate, and it's going to continue to evolve in that way. I think the other cost of it is to universal service fund. The more pushback we see in this conversation, and if we give credence and accuracy to the data that's telling us about investment, and we see more consolidation, who's going to contribute to the universal service fund, which in turn affects people who cannot get online right at this day. They can't benefit from this conversation that we're having right now. They're not digital natives. They need the Universal Service Fund. And right now, for those of you that don't know this, the way that the, the laws are designed, the only people on the hook for this are broadband service providers. So if Title II becomes a mechanism in their argument to quell their investment, we're going to see more consolidation, which will mean less contribution to universal service, which will mean less contribution to the general infrastructure of the Internet that we know today. And then finally, I think it's important to just go back to the basics and update the Telecommunications Act. I think this conversation, if we stay in it, it avoids our ability to go update the Telecom Act, which could bring much more clarity to some of those decisive points if it's parity, if there's parity around platform, if it's technology agnostic. There's so much more in that ex worthwhile in that exercise of updating the act than sitting around. We, we were with a bunch of people the other day from the Hill who said, that will take a long time. I said, but this is taking a long time. <laughs> so why don't we try something that at least be a little bit more productive than actually staying in this space where we're actually not going to reconcile the fact that I'm not a size four. <laughs> it's just not going to happen anymore, right? And so I think as we move forward, it's critical for us to sort of shift the norms of the conversation that we're having. Generations following us, they get it. They want an open internet. 
an open internet exists. Whole Foods buying Amazon is open internet. There's something going on there, right? The way the content is being designed and remastered, it's there. The question becomes, will we find ourselves still talking about this issue and as a result, not dealing with the issues that I personally care more about, digital inclusion, algorithmic bias, and others because our energy and time is still sap trying to figure out the correct fit for an issue that might be somewhat antiquated if this process goes down the route that many of us think, back to the court, et cetera. So to Doug's question, I would just say this, and I, I stand by this, and everybody plays poker, just come find me afterwards. I actually think at the end of the FCC uh, process that we probably will develop a solid record that will land up in Congress. <laughs> because I think the challenge that we have right now is the record, right? And so if we do this right and we're able to get through some of the discrepancies and the challenges, was it bots, was it not bots, et cetera, we'll actually have a record that I think Congress can be comfortable looking at as well and potentially move towards a congressional solution. That's my hope, <laughs> because to uh, Larry's point, I'm not quite sure if we go through this process again, I think you're right, we'll probably land up where we were before. And if we go through a different administration, we'll go back to where we were before and we'll keep debating the same issue while the internet has completely changed and those issues are not as relevant anymore. So I'll leave it at that and open to questions and from Doug. But as you can see, I'm very evangelical about that. A little, you know, teed off because my camp was late. But uh, <laughs> very passionate about this. Well. <laughs> All right, Scott, you you've been following these issues for a long time. Let's get your thoughts uh, as an yeah. economist. Um, I'm not sure. Is this on? The light doesn't. Uh, yeah. Actually, it doesn't make the light on. Okay. I think you uh, should be good. Yeah. Uh, you should be switch. good. I think it's on. Well, all right, I'll take two. Um, well, so, um, first That's of all, a real economist. <laughs> right. That was it. Um, well, they're, they're free, right? So I can talk. Um, I'm going to overconsume microphones. Uh, so the first um, takeaway from uh, Nicole's comments is that she and Larry talked about net neutrality voluntarily by themselves. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so yeah. So this has been going on for uh, for a long for a long time. I wrote about this uh, first more than more than a decade ago, and uh, not a lot has changed. Uh, and so let me put my comments into two parts. Um, the first is sort of just in general about net neutrality and Title II, what I think the problems are with it. And then second, sort of more towards Doug's uh, question, uh, you know. What do we do? What do we do going forward? Because that's really the more interesting part. I mean, we've uh, we all have discussed net neutrality ad nauseum. Nevertheless, um, so the first problem, the first uh, it, problem I have is that you know there's no such thing as neutrality, right? If you if you set um, if you have a standard where you treat all uh, all data the same, then you're advantaging some applications more than others, right? If you want to enter with a very high high quality, high definition, um, interactive video, uh, 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 video chat service, that's going to be a lot more difficult than one that, uh, than an email service, right, just because of the way the network works. Um, if you want a, a service that, re that requires extremely low latency, like for gaming, um, how are you going to make sure that you have that? I mean, we've eliminated an entire class of innovations as a result of this. Um, you know, you can't use Cisco's telepresence system on the public internet because you can't pay for a guaranteed high quality connection, right? So we've eliminated certain types of, uh, certain types of innovations. Saying that all data is the same, uh, treated the same does not mean that it's neutral. Uh, now the second, then the more, the more important issue, I think, is that uh, Title II um, is just common carrier regulation, right? We say, we've been saying, we've talked about this for more than a decade, but really we've been talking about this for more than 100 years. Um, because you can go back and look at the um, intercarrier compensation, uh, uh, sorry, um, not intercarrier compensation, good law, that's another issue completely, um, interstate, uh, um, the ICC. Uh, and interstate Commerce Commission. Interstate Commerce Commission, that's right. Uh, and if you go back and look at the, at the original um, founding, uh, the, the rules with that, they look very, very similar to Title II and net neutrality, except they applied it originally to trains um, and then trucking and so on. It's very, very similar. Uh, and what ended up happening with that was that prices ended up being set by lobbying. Um, you didn't like something, you went to the regulator to complain about how it was priced, and you would get, uh, you would you would have something priced for yourself. And so by 1908, there were 229,000 approved prices um, at the Interstate Commerce Commission. Right? Um, natural gas was regulated the same way, also common carrier. Uh, even though uh, natural gas is natural gas, there were actually 28 types of it. Um, under, under these rules, under, natural, under the natural gas rules. Uh, and so 
we were going title two ends us ends up having us head down that exact same path where if you don't like something you don't compete you go to the regulator to complain about it and we already saw that starting to happen right um, when Metro PCS uh, first offered its its streaming service over its 2g network um, people went to the FCC to complain say that that violated net neutrality uh, and um, uh, we saw that with the Netflix Comcast uh, disagreement. We see that with zero rating, and you'll only see more and more of that. We've seen this movie about common carrier regulation. It doesn't end well, and it's not a good way to regulate um, the internet. And now the third is that, of course, there are issues that you want to worry about. I mean, you don't want um, ISPs to be anti-competitively uh, benefiting their own services at the expense of others, right? And so, of course, the answer is, and you know what I'm going to say, the answer to that is antitrust. And then people who on the other side will say, oh, well, if you say antitrust, well, that means that's just, an, that's just a, another way to say let's not do anything. Um, but that's really a weak counter argument. This nice little straw man, of course, that I set up for myself, Doc, um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, that should apply to any industry, right? I mean, why is this industry so much different that the rules of competition that we have for every other part of the economy do not apply here? Um, that's just not the case. I, you know, they sh it, it may be true that some people want will say antitrust because they would prefer that there be no enforcement, but that's not the way it should be. There really should be antitrust enforcement of these things. And if you believe that a, an ISP is behaving anti-competitively towards your product, you should bring a case, right? Um, now, sort of the more now going on to the question of what we should do now, uh, what um, what the other what um, what Larry, Nicole, and, and Doug have all um, said basically is that you know, we, we've ended up in this situation where. We go, we had Title I, then we go to Title II, and now we're going to have Title I again. Um, the next time we have a, uh, an FCC led by um, a, a Democrat, we're probably going to go back to Title II again. Um, right? There's, there's no stability in this. It's going to keep going back and forth. Um, and the, and so the, pro the issue is we need to find a way to reach a more stable equilibrium. Now, we know that um, legislation, congressional legislation, is more stable than, uh, than regulation. Just there, are, there are more veto points in legislation, which makes it, of course, harder to get to in the first place. Uh, and, and then we know that you know, somebody who doesn't like net neutrality uh, and Title II will say, well, now is a great time to do legislation because we know that you're going to get the kind of uh, a law that says you shouldn't have net neutrality or Title II, right? And if there were a Democratic Congress, um, probably the other side would say, hey, now's a great time to do legislation. Uh, but still, we have to do something to um, to deal with this to deal with this instability. And you know, I think you can you can see the the reasons why it's necessary ultimately one way or another to go to Congress simply by the millions of comments that have been submitted to the FCC. The fact that millions of comments have been submitted in this issue. Now, in in an expert agency and under the Administrative Procedures Act, they are supposed to consider the arguments um, that anyone who wants to can present. Um, they are not supposed to consider how many times that argument is made. So, you know, as the saying goes, um, we need to we need to listen to every argument, but we don't need to listen to every single person say the same argument. Uh, that doesn't make the argument more. Uh, that does make the argument stronger. However, the presence of those millions of comments means that a lot of people do care about it, right? Uh, and the FCC, as an agency, is not an agency that's meant to aggregate society's preferences. It's not what it does. Um, Congress is such an agency. An agency. Congress is such an institution. That's what legislatures do. It's supposed to aggregate societal preferences and come up with a law that sort of reflects that through their um, elected representatives. Now, none of that actually helps us get to, to that because of all the various problems. But it does demonstrate that um, that, that, that you know so that's going to that's the, the more likely way to get to a um, a solution. Um, and let me just throw out one more sort of provocative thing that probably nobody will like, um, just an observation. Um, and, and that's that, um, you know, in some ways it's odd that ISPs oppose being regulated under Title II, right? It's good to be regulated, um, have your prices regulated in the long run. You end up very profitable um, and that your, your en entry is, um, you're protected from entry. Uh, and, um, you know, they, you could make a case that uh, everybody's on the wrong side of this issue. Um, you know, if, if you're, uh, if, if right now, if, if, you, if you think that there's not sufficient competition in, uh, in, in, in um, broadband provision, um, you should not want to protect them from entry. Uh, and if you are an ISP, you should want to be protected from entry, right, um, over, say, you know, some medium term period. Now, obviously, that's not the way, that's not the way it is, and I'm being very blunt and grossly generalizing. Um, but it is another little interesting way to look at it. Um,
So I think I will leave it there. Wonderful. So great, thank you all so much. Um, so sometimes I get uh, after events uh, follow-up questions that are just you know fairly direct, fairly concrete. Uh, just where do people disagree and and straight to the point, right? And so I'm hoping that we can start off with uh, you know specific questions, uh, specific issues teed up in the FCC's restoring internet freedom uh, docket and just make it really concrete. And, I, and so this is sort of like lightning round. You all have more or less answered these questions already, but I just want to make it simple and clear, right? Um, so the FCC's proposed to reclassify broadband internet access service, both fixed and mobile, as a more lightly regulated information service, right? Scott, this is sort of what you were saying, like take this off the track towards common carriage and return it to the sort of more lightly uh, uh, regulated uh, approach. Avoid that slippery slope to uh, a full-blown uh, heavy-handed common carrier regulation. Uh, it is also proposed to do away with the general conduct standard. And so uh, I guess I, I want to get a sort of like thumbs up, thumbs down on each of these issues, right? So Nicole, you were you were saying that you wanted a sort of a fifth bright line, uh, not a catch-all, but it sounds like something kind of close to the general conduct standard. And so let's remove this maybe from the you know the actual uh, legal restraints on the FCC, but under a sort of abstract idealized situation. Uh, so are we all in agreement, uh, you know, away from common carrier? Uh, but then what happens? What what does this uh, sort of general conduct standard look like? Yeah, I, I'm one of those people that actually is in support of maintaining the general conduct standard because I think, um, as it's been mentioned, by, sort of like by Scott, you know, the, the conversation is have a free marketplace, you know, have it antitrust, we'll take care of the rest. I don't think consumers buy that. <laughs> and I think what we're actually finding, again, with this argument of principles versus jurisdiction, removing the FCC of all authority <laughs> over this issue, to me, is, doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, particularly when you're trying to actually resolve it. So I'm a personal fan of the conduct standard. I know uh, when Wheeler was in uh, leadership, it, it sort of got diluted and changed in terms of his meeting. But this case-by-case -case review of these practices actually makes it easier for companies, I think, um, particularly if it's a product that is not anti-competitive, to actually be in the marketplace. Um, and it also helps consumers. I mean, one great example of that where I do believe the FCC was wrong in this case, but I think because of the rhetoric, et cetera, we found ourselves in this space, zero rating um, is one of those uh, programs that was actually falling under the general conduct standard. The question being, is it good for consumers? Is it bad for consumers? Not a hypothetical approach to it, but just sort of looking at the marketplace and seeing where that's at. There was a recent article that just came out that said, uh, right now, mobile prices for the consumer are at their lowest point. There's a reason for that, right? And I would say, and I think some of us would agree, that the availability of Belinda data has probably helped that case because now you're pumping more out to the consumer and their ability to get what they need, which then depresses the cost of it. I tell people I'm kind of old. You know, I go back when the car phone was about two, three hundred dollars and you had to put down a five hundred dollar deposit on a phone. Nowadays, you can go in with ten, fifteen dollars and now even get a prepaid card. So I think uh, I would say thumbs down <laughs> if we're actually playing the game right. I think you need something in there that's going to be a security um, mechanism or leave or trigger for people to understand that there is some authority in place or some type of adjudication in place for bad actors. And I think, you know, generally the ecology should be supportive of that versus saying that there should be no authority or, uh, or obliterating all authority from the FCC. Larry Scott right sounded like more, yeah, sounded like more uh, favoritism towards an antitrust model. I guess what I'm kind of trying to home in on is uh, what are the sort of institutional differences between a pure antitrust model and a sort of general conduct standard at the at the FCC? Well, in part we don't. So the short answer is we don't really know very much about what the general conduct regime would have looked like. Uh, it wasn't in place very long. Uh, we had, as far as I know, really only one investigation under it, but that investigation that you mentioned, Nicole, the zero rating investigation, it was very, very troubling. It was open ended. I mean, right. It kept expanding. <laughs> well, you know, we, this is you know, this, we've heard this before, right? It was an open ended investigation, and it kept increasing its scope, and they kept going back and starting over. And uh, all we actually got was sort of the the interim report, and the interim report said, well, we looked at, we wound up looking at four specific programs. That was good. That at least there were specifics. Four specific programs. Two of them, we don't think there's any issue. Two of them. There might be an issue with one. There may be an issue with the so. Right. And that came two days before the. And that yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I, I think the short answer is we don't really know how an FCC anti-consumer rule would operate differently than than a Federal Trade Commission or a state 
FTC uh, uh, version of it would have looked. But we do have, obviously, the federal and state. They've been around a long time. There's, there's, you know, there's lots of common law. There's lots of case law about how they work. And, you know, they're not perfect, by the way. I don't mean to suggest they are. But um, they're there. And it's not really clear that there was anything broken no. about that. So, um, yeah, so I, I'm not even sure if we were disagreeing. But I, I, I definitely don't like the existing general conduct rule and it's seven non-complete right. factors and it's you know all the sort of bad stuff that went into the yeah, the language there uh, but I am in favor of consumer protection but I think the existing agencies both federal and state do it very well or they do it as well as one can hope for right now I'm, I'm in general and uh, not to speak generally not in favor of bright line rules um, I mean it just like uh, in, in antitrust uh, most it's it's hard to decide that something is per se illegal, right? Usually, most are rule of reason. You want to think very carefully about what you are and are not allowing. It's hard to say that you, you're going to disallow this, and we're going to disallow it forever because we think that anything that falls under this is wrong. That's sort of generally not the way we do things, right? You want you want analysis of whatever the thing is. If somebody believes it's a problem, they should you know you, you should come forth and make that complaint. And then there are these various various suggestions of where whether there should be something at the FCC or joint FCC or FCC and so on. Um, but uh, I, I think bright line rules are, are um, you know, they're, they can be problematic over time. So um, otherwise, I'm just going to disagree. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> otherwise, the, the, the FCC is sort of teeing up a bunch of questions, a bunch of open-ended questions, right? Um, however, the language of the proposal, you know, really pretty strongly hints at the FCC, the current FCC's skepticism of their own authority, um, either you know under Title II or under 706, uh, to to regulate broadband, right? To to uh, maintain rulemaking authority over broadband, uh, and strongly hints that they are going to be sort of kicking this issue right to the FTC or or antitrust rights. So I'm curious. Uh, if maybe you can uh, give a charitable interpretation to the other side and hear what are your concerns, especially for, for Scott and Larry, your concerns about limitations of antitrust. Um, you know, what, uh, and I guess this is sort of uh, teeing up for a potential congressional discussion. You know, what are the issues? Where is it that the antitrust uh, uh, starts to fail us? If that's a, if, if no, that's no, a fair a, question. It's a good question. I have to think about it for a second. Do you, do you have to think about it for a second? I, I would like to think about it for a second. Um, <laughs> so uh, uh, let me answer it backwards. So I, and I, I think this was implicit in, in the story I told about the school district. Uh, I would very much like to see a, a congressional solution for the reasons, um, wait, who's in Scott? You were talking about finality and, and Certainty. Certainty, yeah. So that's right. Um, legislation obviously is not the end uh, of, of anything, but it's certainly much more of an end than, than sort of discretionary activity by politically appointed regulators. So we know, you know, it would be more certain. I don't know if it's certain enough, but it would be more certain. So I, I'm completely uh, help, hopeful that, you know, that there would be congressional legislation at least narrowly saying, you know, the open internet principles are a matter of law, and here's the here's the authority that the FCC and or the FTC has. Um, I, I think I'm agnostic um, about the uh, who gets the authority. I, I, I can see both getting some version of it, but um, basically, you know, the 2010 version of this fight was fine, other than the fact that the FCC didn't have legal authority. So if Congress just said, "Here's the 2010 rules," or some slightly very here's the 2010 rules, here's the authority that you didn't have go away, um, that would be lovely. And I think, you know, we would be on to the, as Nicole pointed out, the much more important things that we have to deal with, which not only include the, the, the inclusivity and closing digital vibe, but also spectrum and all the other things that, you know, really are, are, are important. Um, I don't think it's going to happen, at least not in this Congress. Uh, that, that doesn't seem very likely. But, you know, again, if you threaten to close the schools, um, maybe the adults will actually uh, come to the table. So we'll find out. So, um, yeah, so uh, I'll play devil's advocate against myself then. Um, you know, <laughs> I, a couple of the arguments that are made against antitrust, one is that, um, that it t uh, cases take too long, right, and that the, the uh, <clears throat> innovation moves too quickly for antitrust. Now, I, um, then the question, of course, is, as always, compared to what? Um, and, you know, I wouldn't, I don't think there's any evidence that uh, <clears throat> it moves more slowly than uh, a regulatory proceeding would. Um, and again, why would this apply in one particular industry as opposed to another? 
another another um, state complaint uh, argument that's been made, and this is um, what Hal Singer has been saying, and Hal's not here. And if I if if I misstate what Hal says, I'm very sorry because that's not my intent. But um, that, uh, that that uh, that 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 an antitrust um, uh, analysis does not take into account potential effects on future innovation as parts of the costs and benefits, um, or it doesn't properly take them into account. I, I disagree with that argument. Um, I don't see why that would necessarily be the case. Um, and again, if I'm, if I'm misstating his argument, but then just completely ignore what I, what I said, because I, I'm not trying to set up a straw man here. Um, uh, I guess, I guess uh, one other thing is that it what, um, you know, relates to what Nicole said was that telecom policy historically was bipartisan um, and it was not so politicized. And that was a much, much nicer environment. Uh, and you know, I think that because the antitrust agencies have very clear rules on how they do investigations, those tend to be um, the investigations themselves tend to be less politicized than are the regulatory proceedings, um, and you know you can you can see the you can see the politics in the net neutrality debate now. Every Democrat is supposed to be in favor of net neutrality. Every Republican is supposed to be opposed to it. The um, pro net neutrality people now call it the Trump FCC because these are Trump's policies because we know everybody hates Trump, um, and so therefore this must be a, a terrible terrible policy imposed by. By Donald Trump, and of course, the best thing that could happen is that Donald Trump never pays attention to the FCC because God knows what would happen if he did. Um, and you know, that's just that's sort of those are rhetorical. That's just rhetoric, right? Um, and we should be talking about the issues. And it, um, I would very much like to go back to the time that these were not political, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can I say one thing? Absolutely. Um, and I, I agree with what you know. I'm not an antitrust lawyer, so I'm not even going to try to offer my opinion in there. But I do want to offer this thing about where the argument is. Though. Right? And the challenge, I think, of this debate, if we all could just be real, it's not in this room. Right? It's with consumers that are being mobilized in these very interesting, creative ways. As a research, I found to be, you know, is it a matter of marketing? Is it a matter of the fact that most people just see this versus the content? They don't see the correlation between all of the whole ecology. And I think part of the challenge is, like we talked about the other day, is education and letting consumers know that this ecology is very codependent. <laughs> David and I was kind of talking about this. It, it's no longer these echo chambers that are sort of separated from one another, but they are actually more interrelated and more codependent. And consumers are at the center of this. And I think what they're appealing to, this issue has become politicized, but I'd like to also offer that it's become popular <laughs> to many folks that are you know, mad because a video took too long to buffer or, you know, so they blame it on Comcast. So they find that they can't get service in this community. So they blame it on Verizon. Not knowing that the internet is so much more than just the carrier. And unfortunately, without the investment, we can't get out to some of those places. That's an infrastructure issue, right? And so we're seeing this commingling of all these issues. But what's very interesting about the debate and coming up on tomorrow is that it's being played in the popular view. <laughs> versus what we're talking about, the frameworks for actually adjudicating and reviewing and assessing these issues, which makes this even more complicated because you cannot change the mind of my mother who feels that it's the service provider and not necessarily something else that's maybe unrelated to that. And um, uh, Doug brought up a really great point that I had forgotten the other day about the Netflix issue when Netflix was throttling and everybody was like, it's at and it's Verizon, they're the throttlers. And we found out later it was actually Netflix actually managing their own traffic, right? People don't understand the network enough. <laughs> and so the debate, when it gets played out in the marketplace, looks a lot different. And I think that's what's also complicating this, because people who are calling their member are not calling saying, as we think, I support net neutrality because it's good for reasonable network management and antitrust is not a reasonable option. They're calling them up and saying, I don't like my service provider. <laughs> Which again makes this again harder for policymakers to sort of work through a rational framework and logic for how we actually compromise around this. So I had to add that because I think it's past politicization; it's people that are now chiming in on it. So on this one, uh, I'm gonna start with you, Larry, um, and then Scott, Nicole, if you want to jump in. But um, and I, I don't, I don't like uh, reinforcing the sort of split nature between the two sides of this debate. It's like a big messy debate. But I am struck by, it seems like one side of the debate uh, thinks of competition in a very different way than the other side, right? There's uh, the 
term monopoly gets thrown around quite a bit on one side. There's this term gatekeeper, right, where it's like because consumers go to one ISP at a time, there needs to be special regulation placed on them. The other side tends to think of competition in, uh, you know, much more dynamic terms, uh, seeing 5G's potential to compete more directly with, with wired, uh, with number of options available to consumers. And a, it's sort of a much messier picture. Admittedly, as you said, not perfect competition. But I think a, a point that, that I'm, I'm not sure it got made, but I think an important one, in the whole discussion about uh, zero rating, uh, there's this all this back and forth, all this hand wringing over zero rating, and then the industry, you know, pretty everyone, right? All the major players have moved towards you know unlimited data, and so the the point becomes more or less moot. And so I'm I'm, I'm just curious, uh, Larry, your thoughts on competition. Uh, you're an expert in the matter, so uh, if you can weigh in sort of on the, the this these sort of uh, if it's fair to say there are two different uh, distinct ways of thinking about it. Uh, your thoughts and how that intersects with uh, net neutrality policy. I was feeling so confident until you said I was an expert. Um, <laughs> so I, but I, but so I have been astonished, and I don't. I think there is a, a, a dichotomy, but it's not quite the one you described. It's sort of between the washing the Beltway view of what is competition and the rest of the world uh, view of competition. So, um, you know, most of the, the the work that I do did I don't know anymore. Maybe I'm retired, but um, was in strategic planning. And the literature of strategic planning since the early 1980s uh, has been, you know, based largely on some pretty groundbreaking work by a man named Michael Porter at, at Harvard Business School. And in 1980, you know, Porter said, look, the competition within an industry is not just the direct competition between competing, direct competing providers, but he called, there's what he's called the five forces model. He said, he said, the competition is completely interrelated, so you have uh, pre competitive pressure being placed on everybody by not only their direct competitors but also their buyers, their, their customers, their suppliers, the people from whom they buy raw materials or, or other services, new entrants, potential new entrants, and then substitute products uh, that, that, uh, that in some industries are very common or some industries don't, don't happen at all. But he said if you, you, know, you want to think about uh, how to form a strategy, you have to know that these, these are the pressures that exist. And I, I wrote a, uh, my, my first book in 1998, which had nothing to do with policy uh, whatsoever or telecom. Uh, we said, you know, actually that model isn't even broad enough because, because of the way in which the digital economy is developing. You have these, these even larger forces that are shaping industries, and they include the digitization of industry. And in some sense, some saying innovation is itself a form of competition. So, you know, uh, who beat Yahoo? Was it Google? No, it was better technology. Uh, and that, in fact, you, you see monopolies in the, in the content uh, side of things falling, Microsoft, so they fall not necessarily because of new entrants or because of substitutes or because of pressure from other competitors or buyers, buyers but just because the technology changes out from under them and somebody comes in there faster and, and, and you have this happen. So uh, our argument in 1998 was the, the way of looking about competition is even more dynamic than what Porter said. And then I get off the plane in Washington Every time I'm here, it's like, oh, competition just means you know one to one. Who's who's in your exact market, offering the exact product uh, at, at the exact same price, um, and and yeah. So you can make a you know everything's a mono I mean, I have a monopoly on this microphone right now um, until you, you know, cool. until, yeah. until, <laughs> until Scott takes that one that as well. Monopoly is a word. It doesn't mean a lot in business sense, and of course, it has a very particular meaning in a legal sense. And the way it's used in this conversation doesn't fit either of those, um, from from my standpoint. Nicole Scott, any anything to add on competition? Oh, okay. I mean, I was going to say with the and particularly going back to the zero rating example, where we're actually seeing great competition, you know, lower prices when it comes to mobile. I think the challenge, why it becomes defined differently, is competition uh, and public interest standard. Right? It's it's sort of what we're seeing now with. Um, and I think this is where the FCC was going with that report at the end was, you know, this is good, this is not good, but, you know, we're here to look at the public interest value of any of these products. And because the marketplace has become so saturated to um, Larry's point and because the competition has been defined by competition within local markets, you know, I hear when I hear people talk about competition, it's how many providers are in a market, that kind of stuff. Why do I only have one provider? Why is the price at this cost? What should be explored is the extent to which, and I think this might actually massage some of the um, uh, challenges that we're experiencing outside of the Beltway, 
is where does this competition, where does the rubber meet the road when it comes to public interest standards? So I, I give this example for with free data. Um, what if, and some people have heard me say this, so it's not something I've kept to myself, but what if you looked at free data programs and you added a public service provision to it? In, in, in the case of offering free access to Department of Labor websites or free access to healthcare.gov or other websites that are enabling people to get beyond the digital divide. It sort of massages the perception that it's just a marketplace output for people and it's just all about profit, a profit uh, driving force for companies, which I think again has been sort of at the stickler, the point where we're seeing all this innovation, but the question becomes, you know, to what extent for the FCC in particular, are they also managing the public interest value of this competition that we're seeing? They're ensuring that all markets are covered, et cetera. I think PI is beginning to actually pick up on that. And I think we're actually gonna see more bipartisan support over the infrastructure plans. But I think that's where, you know, to Larry's point, it, there's a beltway, or what somebody said, a beltway versus see, outside yeah. of the beltway conversation that's going on, where people actually, again, going back to my previous point, when they look at it, they're looking at their provider within their local market, and then they're sort of assessing that outside. So it's good when we see companies get on Twitter and say, we support open internet, we're not against net neutrality, we just against Title II. That doesn't mean anything to anybody who's on Twitter. <laughs> you know, it just doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? It's good to say we have free data, it's unlimited, switch your carrier, cut up your bill, but it's also extra special and it, it provides a buffering point if you're able to say, get this free data because it also meets the public interest standard of you being able to get health care. You know, I'm, I'm just trying to, I've, I've been trying to work through that myself because we hear a lot of that in terms of how do you actually look at this issue and sort of try to bring the sides together so that you can have a DC conversation outside the Beltway and a outside the Beltway conversation here. So um, just a, a couple of things. One is, I mean, on the public interest standard, um, so I, I kind of see that the, you can see where some problems might arise with that. I mean, I think yeah. that you should, you know, these are the kinds of things where you could see why you would want different, possibly different levels of service. People always talk about telehealth, right? We'll all be talking, that's always going to be right around the corner. Um, but uh, where you want sort of especially high quality uh, connections between um, your brain surgeon who's in his house and his little lazy boy while he's operating on you. Um, but, <laughs> uh, but I mean, you know, if you, if you, if, if you bring in a public interest standard and say that you know access to all government you know access to government sites shouldn't count against your data by by law, then does that mean you're giving um, you know incumbents in Congress you know now have free you know free advertising? Um, I mean there there are all like these kinds of issues, right? Even though th that kind of stuff that probably doesn't take up very much bandwidth and it probably wouldn't right. matter anyway. Um, but but uh, you know those are those are things to think about. And, and, and sort of on competition more generally, right? It's hard to think about what you know. Uh, competition is complicated, and you can't just say that uh, competition is defined by how many providers you have that give you 25 megabits per second down and 3 megabits per second up, and there's no way that 24 megabits per second competes with 25 megabits per second because the FCC drew a line, therefore those two don't compete. I mean, that's just silly, right? Um, what matters is what people want to do um, with, with the services, and you know, we have imperfect competition with everything. Uh, but still, what matters then is you still want to promote all different kinds of competition. And I think one thing lots of people, most everyone agrees on, is still there's still more spectrum to uh, liberate and bring to um, higher high value uses. Um, there are sort of these really boring things like poll attachment rights um, that uh, that people want. And you know, maybe Google Fiber didn't really work out the way Google had wanted it to, but they sure did a good job of getting a whole bunch of cities to streamline various rules. Um, that then people like you know Blair Levin started um, started his project to, to, to get other companies to sort of take advantage of those loosening of those those rules to bring in new entry, um, and there are lots of those kinds of right. kinds of things that can help promote competition that I don't think anybody really disagrees with. No. Um, that would certainly be helpful. Can I, can I say just one thing? Sure. And, and because you kind of triggered it on the telehealth stuff, I mean the same thing too in this debate right now is this pay prioritization argument is sort of reoccurred. Um, and there are significant, again, public interest reasons why paid prioritization could work when it comes to health care. Um, you know, we advocated for this when I was actually working closer to the ground, where, you know, being able to have the type of um, bandwidth necessary to do remote monitoring or surgery, et cetera, is important. I want that prioritized over, you know, my access to a Netflix, you know. Much better example. Yeah, <laughs> not the lazy boy. Well, it could be the doctor doing the surgery watching House of Cards, but um, which I think is a little scarier, right? But you want that type of pay prioritization to occur. And again, I, I tell people, you know, again, with this debate that we have, well, you can't have this, you can't have that. I, I do agree with my colleagues. You can't be so absolute 
the innovation of of, Nanu, of uh, the internet, again, if you date back to the beginning of this conversation, we weren't even talking about telehealth back then. We didn't have the um, type of ingenuity and innovation um, I've seen at the University of South Carolina, I believe it is, or South Carolina State, one of the universities at a conference where they have a stroke telehealth center where they're actually looking at people remotely. I've seen in Alaska where dermatological surge services are actually provided to remote islands of Anchorage, off of Anchorage where people cannot have access to primary care. So I think, again, these are the types of debates that I think get wrapped up into these broader concepts of competition, you know, how many providers, where we should be thinking seriously about how the Internet, has, again, has evolved and changed, where these should be necessary and, and you know, critical services that should ride over our network. All right, so one uh, one last. Uh, just, you're trying so hard to get us to disagree, but I don't think it's working. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we're disagreeing. There's a lot of agreement. That's true. Um, so one last question before I open up to the audience. Maybe an audience member will be able to to find a, a disagreement on the panel. But um, so one, uh, and and this might be you know impossible. So we we've circled around this question of of legislation and how we actually get to a legislative solution, though. I worry it seems like uh, not a lot of, uh, of legislation coming off of the Hill these days. Um, uh, I would be remiss if we you know, had a net neutrality event and did not mention our report at ITIF. I believe there are copies up front uh, where we put out uh, in 2015 uh, the, the potential for a grand bargain trying to pair uh, authority other than Title II for some baseline net neutrality rules and pair that with something, you know, Put some negotiating chips out there that perhaps people could agree on. It would be a win for one side or the other. That uh, you know maybe try to think outside the box a little bit. So we were putting out there uh, additional spending for rural broadband, for broadband adoption, for digital literacy, uh, uh, things like that to try to. Uh, obviously, the political calculus has changed somewhat since 2015. But I'm curious your thoughts specifically. What so what legislation should look like? That I mean that's a hard question to answer. Or like where do we start? Um, but then I think more importantly, it's like where do you see any opportunities where we could actually get the ball rolling? Where you know where do we uh, where does where does where do we start with legislation to actually see progress? So I'll, I'll go. For, so look, the, uh, let's start with the 2014 Thune Upton Walden bill. Um, um, there's some quibbles. I would change a little bit of the text here and there, but I think it's a perfectly good starting point. For one thing, it basically is the same thing that the FCC came out with in 2010 except that it said, here's authority to, to do these rules. But the, the language of the rules was very similar. In fact, the, the Thune Upton Walden proposal was further than the 2010 rule because it brought in wireless completely the same as wireline, which the 2010 rule didn't do. And it had a ban on paid prioritization, which the 2010 FCC. So it was uh, stricter, I guess you could say, than the 2010 FCC version. And it obviously solved the authority problem. Um, and, of course, it went nowhere in 2014, not because people thought it was bad legislation or people thought it was good legislation. It had nothing to do with it. Obviously, it was completely a political calculus. It seemed, at the time, a reasonable assumption that Democrats would retain uh, control of the FCC after the, 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 uh, the, the uh, 2016 election. And so there was no reason to negotiate. I, so that, to me, is right. So we, we can talk about the legislation all we want. And, and as I say, that bill you know, sounds is a perfectly good starting point to me. The problem is, as I've learned <laughs> from my years of coming to Washington, what gets done has nothing to do with uh, policy. It has nothing to do with whether or not this is a good bill or a bad bill, or this is solves the problem or doesn't solve the problem. It's all about much more complicated politics um, uh, and things having, of course, nothing to do with the, these actual topics that we're talking about. So what would get legislation moving isn't better legislation. Um, it's whatever it is that gets legislation moving, which as far as I can tell, uh, is 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 undefinable, um, and getting and getting and given the output of legislation over the last eight years, uh, and certainly you know in the in the last six months, uh, we're going to see less and less of it all the time. Um, so, uh, on the one hand, you know I'd love to sit down and redline the Thune Upton Walden bill, but I don't know that that really will make any difference, and not because we can't agree on the language, uh, or we can't agree on the policy. It's because that's not what matters in legislation. Nicole, any, I don't know, it's perhaps terrible. less depressing thoughts? I know. Can't we all get along? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm 
in this space where, you know, I, people who know me, I try to be just pleasantly optimistic that something can happen. I'm like, I'll go in the room and talk to everybody, you know, something has to happen. And I think the challenge is, I mean, Larry is right, you know, given the fact that net neutrality is really not on the high marker, you know, the, the Dems and Republicans are looking at health care. And if you actually follow the health care process, it should give you some insight into how this problem could potentially be solved. Essentially, health care came out with repeal and replace, and it went back to repeal, and now it might be replaced, and now it's something else where it might just be a different health care bill, right? And the challenge that we're seeing, I think, across all of Capitol Hill, we're all aware of, is the fact that the Dems and Republicans, it's, it's a lot of political uh, firepower out there, and there are the defining of winners and losers, and the Dems right now are holding on to this. I mean, it's been clear in the press that this is something they're going to hold on to. Um, we just saw something that they got for the commission, and hopefully that would be helpful to sort of move people to the table. But I agree with Larry that in Washington it's, it's not about, in some cases, not, not all, because I think the, again, bipartisan legislation produced great spectrum channels, et cetera. <laughs> the challenge here is that we're in a po very politicized area and under tr perceived Trump FCC, which I think Pi has tried not to be wholly Trump defined, um, politics get in the way. Um, and, and I think that's very disheartening from the standpoint that the more that this, again, stops, we're not getting to the very issues of the, the battle of net neutrality. It's not about poor black and brown people and seniors, in all honesty. It's really digital natives that are out there using the Internet in a different way. And I'm okay saying that because those are the people that are not being represented on the screens of these debates and they're not on Twitter. Um, the challenge, though, I think to move forward to your point is I agree that the Thune bill was great, but I also think we might want to go back to Waxman's bill in 2010, which is a Democratic um, suggestion of, you know, sort of looking at this issue. I mean, Waxman at that time, he did want to regulate wireless the same way as wireline, but that was 2010. You know, I think he might, if he was still in Congress, be able to come back with a different solution. He was also looking at provisional application of the rules for Congress to sort of come back and review these again. Um, he was pretty fair on authority. There's some cases where he was for Title II, but in the conversations with his staff at the time, he was willing to sort of look through all the odds. That bill went nowhere <laughs> at that time, and honestly, there wasn't a lot of political um, bantering then. It was just that no one saw the value of his bill. Um, and I think, you know, and I think if we all saw the value of bill, we'd probably be in a better place right now, right? Because we'd probably be talking to each other. Um, I would say if I were the Republicans, and I, I think Thune's intentions are very integritous when it comes to trying to reach some type of resolution. The challenge has been on the Republican side, which I think could be the beginning of this, is to take out all of the other rhetoric that's happening on that side and sort of come in open-minded around this. I mean, it's hard to look at Thune when two weeks later or early this year, Lee comes out and wants to use CRA and just repeal it, right? So you've got to tell the Republicans to stand down for a minute. <laughs> and if we're trying to get to true repeal, because the other challenge, I'll just say this, is there are no bartering chips on the table for the Democrats. A couple of years ago, in 2014, Lifeline was on the table. Mm. Uh, mm. Now there's nothing on the table for them to want to negotiate around, right? There's nothing that they can get. So part of the other challenge is, I think, if, if we have one side <laughs> who's actually interested in compromise, sort of standing down and saying, hey, we're open to a conversation, Bill Nelson on the Senate side has said, I'm optimistic to talk, but he gets upset every time something happens uh, on the Hill that suggests that he needs to go back in his office and lock the door. And so I think, you know, again, this could play out on the Senate side because I think you've got willing actors that do talk to each other. Mm -hmm. But you've got to come in with something that, again, in my opinion, meets the consumer protection side of it. That's what the Dems care about at this time, figuring out where you get, where's the noodle for consumer protection and enforcement might be a, a starter for them in terms of the conversation versus, you know, sort of saying that that's not the priority in terms of this legislation. Um, so uh, I think Homer Simpson said it best. But, um, <laughs> Usually he does. It's, uh, you know, it, it's easy to be a critic and fun, too. Fun. Um, but <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's a lot harder to think of, of how this might actually go forward. And, and I mean, I'm, I, it's hard to see a reason why any legislation would ever happen. I mean, this is a great issue to raise money off of, right? I mean, why, why, are, why are they gonna, why, why would they bother to do anything before the elections when anybody, you know, if they are, they're in a district where people care about it one way or the other, they can go back and raise money. And also to sort of, sort of a little bit contradict um, all, all, of the, um, all of the debate, it probably isn't gonna affect the way the internet works that much at all. I mean, there was never, there wasn't any evidence that anybody's stock moved in response to any sort of shock, uh, you know, and new information about about this stuff, right? So in the short run, at least, 
you know, the internet will, no matter what, is just going to keep working the way it works, right? So they don't feel any real pressure to do anything. Can I say something like last thing? And I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you, Scott. I'm just going to just put something out there, though, real quick. Oh, he's like, dog, I thought I had a disagreement coming in. Well, if you want me to be a little forthright, I can bring up my New York in me. I think it's important that Dems need to care about this. I really do. I mean, I think the 13% of Americans that are not online right now who constitute the digital divide that are seniors, people from rural communities, people of color, low-income people, people without a high school degree, they need to get online and they need to be participating in this digital economy that is rapidly changing the way they live, learn, and earn. Can I take back? No, you can't take it back yet. <laughs> I'm not I done. I want to agree with you on yeah, that. Yeah, I, mean, I think that's what I should no, care but, about. No, but that's what we should, that's what we should care that's, about. And what, like what you said earlier, right. this debate is taking away from that one. That, right, is, and that's what I'm saying. So I, yeah. I, so I take back the mic for a minute. <laughs> I think it's important, and I mean, I say this because I think the way that the debate has sort of flipped itself is I think it started with these intentions, again, of free speech, First Amendment right, everybody gets a chance. To your point, the Internet is going to continue to evolve, but the challenge is the people that could benefit from it the most are going to fall further and further behind. And if my Democratic friends do not understand that by sitting there and making this into political dogma debate, that is basically enabling gamers and high bandwidth users to do what they have to do, you're not doing anything for me. What you're doing is you're actually leaving people poorer and more secluded from the value of the, of the net in a way that takes away from telehealth and educational purposes, et cetera. I wish people could hear that message, and there's probably people who troll my Twitter account. I don't care, because I think it's important for people to hear that it's beyond a conversation of dogmatic politics. You cannot do things in society without access to the web. And when you don't have a credit card to get an Uber, you pay more. <laughs> when you don't have access to you know, remote you know, monitoring of your electricity or whatever, you pay more. When you don't have access to telemedicine because you live in a community that doesn't have a hospital, you die quicker. And so I think it's important that Democrats actually come to the table on that basis alone, but that means the marketing and the messaging has to change to make it important for this to become that type of conversation. You want to take the mic back because, you know. I like that. Okay, no, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, I think we have the time for a few questions. If we have any questions for the audience, yes. I believe we have a, a microphone, and if you could uh, identify yourself and your affiliation, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Turning to a 20. Uh, no surprise that we've only focused on the United States. This is when the Internet is That's not very, a U.S. That's right. um, network. And the debate seems to be taking a very different shape in other countries. I mean, there isn't really the equivalent of an authority debate. Right? Telecommunication, internet is relatively settled, as far as I can tell, in most other countries. We can debate as to whether that's a good thing or not. So I'm curious as to what, if anything, we can learn one way or the other based, based on legal treatment, or other mechanisms that other countries have developed, regions have developed in that, as opposed to just treating that as a U.S. specific problem. You don't want to take that? Yeah, I mean, I, go ahead. I can say on the zero rating, I agree with you. I think, um, and in fact, um, our colleague Rosalind Layton has, is doing some research on how different countries handle the net neutrality issue. And what she's finding in her research that companies, because they tend to be a lot more collaborative in their regulation of various issues, um, and she's doing a, a, I think it was Denmark and another country, uh, the, Netherlands. the Netherlands, where she talks about telecommunication policy and how they get to this. I think you're right that they're more settled, but they also tend to have more input that takes a balanced approach. So I give a perfect example with the zero rating argument. Um, I know I contributed a letter to the Barrick um, process where they were looking at whether or not zero rating should or should not be permitted. Well, they just recently came out a rep with a report where they actually give a balanced position on why it's actually not as harmful as most people had thought. The challenge, you know, I found in other countries has been, you know, again, the populism that comes up that speaks to the issue. But I agree with you. I think regulators there, and, and Rosin said something I thought was pretty profound, that a lot of the Internet issues globally have moved from the regulator of, of you know, the Internet to more antitrust and, and competition departments. So it, they've sort of changed the nature of the question. Versus here, we're sort of stuck in the same verticals and same boxes of how we actually discuss this issue. Um, but yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think we tend to, in the United States, not see how our behavior is in sync or out of line with uh, our global counterparts when it comes to that. 
Yeah, I, <clears throat> it's a great point, it and and point. we should also be we should be doing more. I mean, you mentioned Rosalind's work. Uh, I mean, that's uh, that provides great variation for us to study what the effects of it um, might be on both infrastructure and edge companies. We should be we should be absolutely taking advantage of those differences to study, you know, to have more empirical work on this question. And we're finding, I mean, honestly, I mean, the press is playing it out, and I've started looking into this, that really their issue is not what we're talking about with the service provider. Theirs are with the, with the edge providers when it comes to monopolistic practices, right? So the, the Google is a case of what the decision is. They're looking at stuff like that, which I find to be interesting because we're not really learning from each other on that. I would just, I would also add, I think it's worth noting that, you know, different countries internationally have very different histories, different right, industry yeah. structures, different regulatory structures, right? And so, you know, especially if you look at countries that have very limited cable build out and you have, right. at least in the wired context, an explicit monopoly with retail competition on top, right? That might lead to very different answers to a net neutrality regulation, right? So, in the back. Hi, uh, Tim Sparapani from SPQR Strategies. Uh, two observations and then a question. So I'm one of the few people I think in town who gets to represent privacy and consumer advocates, trade associations, startups, and large companies. Observation one, there is rough consensus that legislation is needed, and I think it's around the, the, the format that Nicole was suggesting of four plus one principles. I think that's, there's a consensus there, and it's not a new consensus. But I think more and more people are at the point where we should just simply agree and write this legislation and move on and get the finality that I think Larry and, and Scott were asking for. Uh, observation number two, I think I, I was kind of struck by the, the fact that the panelists didn't talk very much about what I think is the real point of competition, which is over data now. And it seems to me that if that's true, then question, uh, isn't the legislative dance that we need to do going forward bigger than just the four plus one principles? It's also perhaps ripping out the 96 Act root and branch and thinking about how it is we're going to set up the rules of the road over competition for data in the future because that seems to be where all of the convergence across formerly siloed industries is moving. Competition over data and impact of net neutrality policy. Um, I mean, that's another, that's a, I, I mean, that's going to be a panel issue, unto itself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I would say that that's an example of um, some of the dangers of writing in bright lines, right? Because issues change, yeah. um, and why do you want to sort of put in place particular rules that you think are relevant for something right now when it might be something late, different later? Yeah, I mean, I think your question is very interesting. I mean, Blackburn's mm. legislation that came out like shocked everybody, right? Because it was not part of the net neutrality debate, but then it's like privacy legislation. And it was privacy legislation that went, that didn't really look at the fact that people have actually, the multi-stakeholder process sort of resolved a lot of those concerns in terms of opt-in. Um, I'm writing blog on that right now because I find it to be interesting uh, to your point. But I think your question is really well taken. It kind of goes back to this whole net neutrality debate and what are the issues of today. You know, data is definitely a commodity right now and we're seeing all types of um, resulting factors that come out of data that have nothing to do with blocking transparency, et cetera. I would say in a complicated DC, I wouldn't mix and mingle both. And it's something I said to the congressman, I was like, I'm not sure if you wanna, I asked to the panel, are you trying to combine these issues? And she sort of said they're separate, but ultimately they could result in one set of legislation, which I think would make this more complicated personally, uh, which is why I am a fan of Bright Lines because I think we need to simplify this so that we can actually resolve it. But I think your points are right on. And I think they will bring up a new set of factors. So just think for, come with me for a minute, when the broadband privacy rules were um, uh, changed or uh, vacated. Remember disapproved. the disapproved. Disapproved, I don't know what it was, but I just know my mother called me, right? <laughs> Talking about my cable company has all my data, which really wasn't the case by some of the stuff that a lot of people up here have written about. But the, the, the fact of the matter is that became very charged. And for two to three weeks, we were in the same type of net neutrality stalemate with privacy. So I would suggest that we actually take those apart. I think to the point of my colleagues, this is a great intervention for the FTC who has collected, you know, lots of da data on this to sort of come in. And we can go back. I mean, were you, I think years ago, many of us, maybe 10 years ago, were in a privacy rules of the road oh, yeah. forum talking about privacy before it was even a concept <laughs> of online privacy. But, um, but to your point, I think, yes, 
I completely agree with you, and that is part of my fear that that, that will open up and make this even longer. <laughs> um, but I think they actually should be separated. So I want to disagree. Um, <laughs> I want to disagree with everybody, but hi, Tim. Good to, good to see you. Um, um, I've, you know, I've been living in Silicon Valley a long time, and I sort of now adopt the principle that um, until there's actually a problem that I can put my hands around, I don't want to regulate anything. So it's, it's, it's sort of what Scott is saying about bright lines are dangerous, but it's in, more than that. I'm just saying regulation for a market that's emerging, that we don't know what it's going to look like, we don't actually know what problems are going to be there, is also dangerous. Um, and I would prefer to wait until there's an actual problem um, that can't be solved any other way than, than, than regulation. I think that's the Silicon Valley approach implicitly, if not explicitly, and I guess I've, I've bought into it. <laughs> well, yeah, and regulating is dangerous too. Yeah, so that's, both sides, right? That's the that's the that's the problem. I think we either have time for one more question or any closing thoughts uh, from our panelists, or we can close just a few minutes early. Any any final thoughts? I better not be here in ten years talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> you might well be. And I better not be sitting next to Scott talking about this. <laughs> Still, um, can I can I just say one final thought? I mean, I think that. Um, Thank you to ITIF to actually do this. Yeah. They've got some really great work coming out on this topic. Doug continues to do really great, uh, thoughtful pieces on this. Thank you. I agree. You do that. <laughs> we, we, we like you, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. But I think as we all leave the room, I think the most important thing to think about, you know, in our pessimism, there is a slight bit of optimism um, that we should be thinking about with this issue, particularly since the POTUS hasn't really put his hands directly into it. Um, the question becomes, what does that optimism look like today, but really in five to 10 years, right? And um, that's the beauty of the internet. I think that's why the three of us are like the, the road show, because we've been sort of talking about this issue for the longest time, but the issues become more complicated. So I thank you for just putting this together, because I, you know, I think that this is a conversation worth having. Well, thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Uh, join me in thanking our panelists. Uh, appreciate you all for coming. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Doug. Can't be turned up. Oh, really? Yeah, it's uh. <laughs> Yeah, right. I saw that. Yeah.